Turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. The book of Colossians, chapter 2. Message appropriately named, Complete and Thee. And um, I think you'll see why uh, by the close of the message this evening. There was a preacher <clears throat> that found himself in the middle of a fight in his community. Some unsavory business had set up shop near a school in his community. And he and others within the community um, basically went to court with this particular business being so close to a school. Truly believed that it posed a real threat to the welfare of the children, so he fought it. And the fight, as I said, ended up in court where a slick lawyer tried to undermine the pastor's credibility. And at one point during the trial, the lawyer asked, are you not a pastor? And doesn't the word pastor mean shepherd? And the preacher agreed. And then the lawyer said, well, if you're a shepherd, why aren't you out taking care of the sheep? And the preacher responded, because today I'm fighting the wolves. The book of Colossians, as well as a few others of the epistles especially, is given to us to fight wolves. Paul was fighting wolves, or one of the other apostles were fighting wolves. Paul calls them that in Acts chapter 20. He warns the believers in verse 28 of chapter 20 of the book of Acts, to take heed over themselves and to all the flock that they take the oversight of the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And then he says this, For I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There were a faithful group of believers in the city of Colossae that were facing some wolves, false teachers that were saying that Jesus Christ was less than he was. They had diminished him personally and diminished in conjunction with him, diminished the work of salvation that he had accomplished. These were some of the perverse things that they were speaking of. And so the Apostle Paul writes them and tells them that the, that the fullness of God is in Christ. And that Christ is, if you know him, he is within you. And that there was nothing to be added by virtue of that. If you have Christ, he is in you. You have the fullness of God within Christ, and that is enough. This is the theme of the book. And this evening, as we are looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we're going to see this theme expanded. We looked at it last time, last in the last chapter, where he says, uh, where he talks about the fact that he is the express image of his person and other things. And so he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, For I would that you knew what great conflict I had for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying in beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, 
abounding therein with thanksgiving, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the wor world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Father, bless the reading of your word to us. Help me to make it plain. Pray in Jesus' name. He tells us in this passage of Scripture that we, that there are four things about Christ that we need to be. And the first is in the first few verses that we are to be united around Christ. Now he begins to share how burdened he was for the believers here in the first part of chapter 2. He had a desire for them to know that he cared about them. A desire to know someone cared. Someone said that they, they will not care what you know until they know that you care. I think there's truth in that. Paul says to them, out the gate, for I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. Great is is a mount not in the uh, greatness of power, but a great, uh, uh, the idea of lots of conflict. It's where we get our word agony. In the Greek is agon. It's the word agony for us. And even though he had not met personally many of them, he was greatly burdened. He had great conflict on their behalf, including those in Laodicea and everyone he had not personally met. I want you to know this. It is a, I don't want anybody ever worried or anxious, but I have, it is appreciated when someone comes up to you and says, I've been thinking about you a lot lately. Do you ever have somebody do that? I want you to know that I've, I've been burdened for you lately. Well, you don't want somebody burdened down, but it is kind of nice to know that there's someone that cares. By the way, if someone's on your heart, and you've been praying for them, tell them that you've been praying for them. You'll bless their hearts. And Paul wanted them to know that he was burdened for the believers. And he was someone who desired encouragement for them. Notice again in verse 1, or verse 2 rather, that their hearts, in order that their hearts might be comforted. That word is the word parakleo, uh, which you know we think of comfort as like if somebody is grieving that you're putting your arm around them and comforting them, it would include that, but it has more the idea of encouragement, that he wanted to encourage them, um, to strengthen them. And the word carries with it the idea of strengthening. So Paul wants the believers to be encouraged and strengthened. So he was someone who desired encouragement for them, and someone who desired not only encouragement, but compounded strength among the believers. Now here's... Uh, where it gets interesting, in my opinion, it says, "Your hearts that you, that their hearts may be comforted." How? Being knit together, being knit together. Now we'll, we're going to pause there. The idea is that there was not simply a single strand, but there were many strands being woven together, as in a rope. Most of you probably have looked at a rope, right? I mean, you've you've seen that it's not just one big thread, it's a, it's a composite of interwoven lines of cord or whatever it might be. Uh, the idea being that one is not as strong as several together. And that's the idea. One increases the strength of a cord or thread by intertwining the strands together. As Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, a threefold three cord is not quickly broken. But notice what he says here, being knit together in what? In love. That's the first strand. Being knit together in love, in agape. I don't know if you've ever seen a tree blown over. It's usually by itself. It blows over and all the roots are just up in the air. Did you ever see that? You don't see that as often in a grove of trees. When there's a bunch of trees planting around 
cut together. Why? Because their roots are intertwined. Their roots go around one another and intertwine, and so it's the, it's the strength of the root system that holds many of these trees in place when otherwise they would have toppled over. This is the idea that you and I, as believers in Christ, in an assembly of a local church, that we are to love each other, but being knit together, the idea is one of strengthening. I want you to be strengthened because of being knit together in love. But it doesn't stop there. It is also being knit together with their persuasion in Christ. Notice what it says in verse 2. Being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. <laughs> this is one long thought, so stay with it. And unto, and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom? For all the riches, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Those, that long thought there is everything that is true about the person and work of, of, of Christ by the Father, everything that is true and all the treasure that resides in him, that's part of the strengthening that we are to experience between believers. So it's not just, it's not just this idea of love. By the way, in, in many churches, they, we, we talk a lot about that. But it's love more as an emotion. Love is more of as a really tight social uh, bond, which is, you know, true, yes. But it's not, it's not love wedded with truth. It's just camaraderie. And yes, we are to have camaraderie, but that camaraderie that you and I share is, because, is on the basis of Christ and what he has done for us and everything about him. And so this is what he's saying here. It is, a, it is another strand woven in, knitting together our love for one another and in, in our bond in the person and work of Christ. And that's what he means together, being knitted unto all the riches of the understanding. Of what? In the persuasion of the mystery of God in Christ to the acknowledgement, the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Um, and of the Father and of Christ. Now, what, what is that mystery? Well, in, in large part, it's the incarnation, what we're ta talking about this Christmas season. 1 Timothy 3.16, you may recall, we, and we covered this a while back, it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Do you remember the verse? God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. This mystery that he is referring to, the full assurance and understanding of the mystery of God, is God in flesh coming into this world in the form of a human being and being the expressed image of the person of God, revealing God to us in a way we would never know him otherwise. So that is the proper understanding of God in Christ. To, to understand that Jesus Christ is God incarnate is not optional. It is fundamental. He is the Son of God. He is God the Son who as man suffered your condemnation and as God paid your eternal penalty and bestows God's righteousness upon you when you trust him. His record applied to you, and you were accepted because you have the righteousness of God in Christ. And all of this is based on an appreciation of his value. Notice in verse 3, in whom, are, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You may remember that one of the verses we preached upon in chapter 1 had the word all and every. every it, it, it was just saturated with it. Paul's making a point here. Jesus is just not some of the revelation of God. He is not just, just a part of Christianity. He is the person of eternity. So get this. We are to be strengthened by two things. Knit together our love for one another and our mutual love and, and comprehension of the Savior, Jesus Christ. This is absolutely crucial. It's crucial. I'm, I'm concerned 
that Christians are not knit together on the basis of Christ as much as on the basis of, of maybe particular programs in their local church. It's an easy error in our desire to attract people. We, we want to attract them with the beauty of our buildings or the quality of our services or the practicality of our teaching or the persuasiveness of our preaching, our sensitivity to felt needs of people, the warmth of the family atmosphere, the enthusiasm of a and stimulating music program, the militancy of our stand, or whatever it might be, as opposed to knowing Christ and making him known. It ought, it, the unity that we are to experience as believers is centered on the person and the love of Jesus. Crucial. Apostle Paul says you have someone in you who contains all the wisdom and knowledge of God himself, and we are knit together by love and the persuasion of what we know of him. That's why it's crucial that we provoke one another unto love and to good works, as Hebrews says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Our knitting, our, our, the basis of our being knit together assumes that we are going to be together as a body of believers. There is no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. The Christian life was never meant to be lev lived independently. I was uh, chatting with somebody before the service tonight about A.W. Tozer, and I don't know if that name rings a bell. I've quoted him periodically here. I've really appreciated uh, the writings of uh, A.W. Tozer. But he was writing on unity, and this is what Tozer said. He said, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tune tuned to the same tuning fork, are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So, 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Isn't that a great quote? I, I was talking to somebody, like I said, before the service, and I said one of the things uh, about, about Tozer was he, he had very quotable quotes. They were worth quoting. We are to be united around Christ. We are to be settled upon Christ. Verse 4, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now, he says this because there are people as Christians who are not very discerning. So we are to have a, a discerning faith. Why? Because there are people out there who are pretty slick in the way they talk and the way they communicate, and they're pretty persuasive. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. There are people who believe their mission is to persuade others. Sometimes they're referred to as ex-evangelicals. Sometimes they're, they're professors in a college. But they, they have it as their mission to dissuade, especially kids in Christian, from Christian homes, to dissuade them away from Christ. He says, I'm telling you this so that you will not be fooled by slick words. I am telling you this lest you should be beguiled. There are people that are not very discerning. I, I lovingly refer to them as spiritual dipsticks. They're just not very discern discerning. I, I, I recall especially uh, one couple some, almost 40-some years ago now, but uh, we were sitting discussing, and I was the new pastor of the church, and I was just meeting people, and, and this older couple professed born-again believers, and I really believed that they were saved people, but... It, but they watched every single week a, a cult um, 
some of you older folks would remember this. It was called The World Tomorrow with, do you remember the guy's name that sponsored that? Herbert W. Armstrong. And they had Herbert's son at that time, a guy by the name of Garner Ted Armstrong, was somebody who was just an excellent, excellent speaker. I mean, he was a heretic. But in terms of being enjoyable to listen to and winsome and telling stories, Garner Ted was far better than most, uh, most preachers in our circles or any others. He was really a good speaker. He was a bad man, but a very good speaker. And these folks got enamored with him. And of course, if you knew anything about the Armstrong cult, they were all about pro prophecy and predicting the future and supposedly applying prophecies to world events. And, and people were very intrigued with that. And this particular couple, they were just they were just very, very enthused about anything that had to do with prophecy. And Garner Ted could spin it very, very well. And they would send him money as born-again Christians who, and they, they did not know what he believed. They just enjoyed all the prophetic, most of it nonsense, that he would spew. Spiritual dipsticks. We are to have a discerning faith. I am writing you this lest any should beguile you um, with enticing words. And then he says this, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. And then notice what he says, joying and beholding your order. Now let me just say this, that they were to have an orderly faith. That phrase there is, is we would, if we weren't paying attention to it, we would, we would read it through and not pay, you know, not give it a thought. Beholding your order. What Paul is alluding to there is the is the military placement of, of Roman legions. And not simply the way they marched, but the way they fought. There were people in, in, in well, they're in every army, but especially the Roman legions, there were people whose job it was, was to be basically one of a whole line of human shields. Their, their shields linked, and their job was to march forward and then behind them were archers or spear throwers or whatever. But these guys, their job was to advance forward with a shield. And then at certain points, they would part and somebody would, you know, other groups of guys would shove spears through there or throw them or shoot or whatever it might be. But each one had a column and they had a job to do. That was called, that's the word used here. I am beholding your order. The idea is, is their cohesiveness and their steadfastness in a battle formation. It speaks of a solid line of resistance. And Paul is saying to them, I am really proud of you. I am so impressed. Joying and beholding your solid line of resistance. The idea of their faith in Christ, that it was stationed and established and entrenched solidly on Christ. Standing, united, unified in him, and standing committed to him. Notice he says, beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And so uh, he talks about they're uni being unified in him. And then he's talking about their commitment. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. He's telling them, keep doing what you're doing. You have received Christ. Now continue. Now keep walking in him. Since you've now set on Christ, don't waver, don't change, stay true, walk in him. That word walk is talking about lifestyle, which means... Uh, your thinking and your disposition and your attitudes and your goals and your purposes all affected by your relationship with Christ. So they were to have a discerning faith and an orderly faith and a faith embedded in Christ. Look at verse 7. Rooted and built up in him. Rooted in him. Out, out west, especially, there are uh, bushes that who, uh, of these bushes, their roots only go down very, 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 very um, 
not very deep at all, they're very shallow. And when the wind blows hard, these scrub bushes are uprooted, and they're called what? Tumbleweeds. Yeah. There's a tree around here. I pass it almost every day on Purdy, Purdy Road, uh, which doesn't have that issue of shallowness. It's called a willow tree. And willow trees, even in the driest droughts, usually remain green because their roots run uh, very, very deep underground. Willows have been known to break water pipes to get the water. Listen, that's the difference between a willow tree and a tumbleweed. The tumbleweed is easily uprooted and blown with the wind. He is saying to these believers, you are willows. You are rooted and built up in him. This word build up <coughs> is an architectural term. It means exactly what it's it, it, like. You are, you've got a foundation that goes down deep and you are built upon, a uh, build up from that. So it is a faith embedded in Christ. Now keep in mind the line, the line of thought that's going on, on here. You have a discerning faith, you have an orderly faith, you have an embedded faith, and you have an abounding faith, abounding therein with what? Thanksgiving. So, as they, when they first, from the time they first got saved, their understanding and appreciation and their love had increased in the knowledge of Christ. Do you know that that is the Christian life? It is becoming, in terms of your spiritual walk and your preoccupation and indeed infatuation with Jesus Christ, that ought to increase over time. You ought to be more in love with Christ now than you ever were before because you, you know more about him and you appreciate. Uh, you, I appreciate, you know, one of the things is when I, as I have grown in my Christian life, I see my sin more clearly. I have more of a defined sense of what I needed, what I needed to be saved from, from than the time I actually got saved. I was under conviction of sin, and I knew what sin was, and I had repented and turned to Christ. But after 50 years, I now look back and say, wow, I had, I had really no sense of what God had saved me from. I do now, because I understand holiness better. And so I understand the magnitude of the sacrifice of Christ for my sin now. And I think I'd appreciate it even more. He is saying here that you should have an abounding faith in Christ, coupled with thanksgiving. The more time goes by, you ought to be more grateful for your salvation than you were when you first came to know the Lord. So, this faith is saturated and punctuated with thanksgiving. United around Christ, settled upon Christ, exclusive to Christ. Look at verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He's saying... You better sift things very, very carefully. Be wary of the influencers of secular or false thought. I said earlier that there are those whose personal mission is to persuade people away from Christ. I, there is a phenomenon that I've noticed in the last five years, and uh, it began with a lot of very popular what, who were they called themselves evangelicals, but they were kind of like riding high on a on an evangelical wave and on, on the megachurch wave. Um, Josh Harris was one. Uh, there have been others. Uh, they're escaping my my, my uh, mind right now. But high profile evangelicals who have come out and denied the faith, and then they've got to tell everybody about it, as if. As if denying the faith wasn't bad enough, now they have to have a blog and or a radio program, or they have to go on the, the the interview circuit on television and radio and tell all about how they had come to reject Christ. There are those on a personal mission 
to persuade others away from Christ. Philippians 3.18 calls them the enemies of the cross of Christ. They have something to gain by that. Let no man spoil you. That, that word is the idea that they are taking something or they are getting something. And that getting of something may not be financial at all, may be egotistical. Whether it's an ego boost or whatever it might be, they're gaining something, but spoiling you. Sometimes I think it may be just to affirm their own decision, to see how many people they can get to, to, to leave the faith that somehow bolsters what they have done. Be wary of the influencers that are out there and be aware, be aware of the influence that they are peddling. Notice he names philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, and the rudiments of the world. Philosophy is any secular worldview contrary to the faith. Vain deceit is its an interesting word. It, it's an empty delusion. Empty delusion. We'll come back to that in a moment. But it's, it's more of a, an idea that is attractive because it's desirable and not for any persuasive, not for any rational or logical reason. It's just something I want to do, and so here's, here is the ideas presented. And so it's attractive because it's appealing. The tradition of men simply means that, that ideas that have been passed down from generation to generation by virtue of longevity and repetition, they are accepted as true, and they're not really challenged. They're talked about. It's just that they've always been taught that. And the rudiments of the world are basically the framework of the culture. You know, what are rudiments? Well, essentially, they're the basic ingredients. You know, like, I don't, I'm not real good at baking, but I know that flour and eggs and milk and sugar, lard, I suppose, I mean, if you cook with that, but it, those are all the rudiments of a cake, right? Maybe not the lard, butter, yeah. Um, but those are all the, the rudiments of a cake. And so when he talks about the rudiments of the world, he is talking about the makeup of a godless culture, the things that they place value on, the things that they believe. And he, he says, beware of all of these things. It's, it's the cultural ingredients. And this book of the Colossians doesn't really point out the doctrines that are being attacked. Uh, he doesn't give detailed analysis of this. But as John MacArthur said, he said, any system of error is going to collapse in the face of the truth. And so this book emphasizes a truth. What, what is the truth? The fullness of God is in Christ. You don't need anything else. There are, even in our circles, in gospel preaching churches, those who would replace Christ with self-help theories and psychology and formulas. There are those, even in our circles, who would take a syncretistic approach. It's, they would take Christianity. They, they don't want to reject that, but what they want to do is take secular thought and blend it. There are things being espoused today that I, from those who profess to be born-again people, that 40 years ago, I would have never dreamed that they would have gone there. And by that I mean a, a syncretism of the, of the theory of ev evolution with the beginning chapters of the book of Genesis. In the last 15 years especially, it's become popular to say that the first few chapters of Genesis is just poetry and it's just allegory and it's not literally true, even though Jesus you know, alludes to it. And they don't seem to get the idea. And they say, well, that's not literally true, but what Jesus did on the cross is, is true. But Jesus quotes from the early first chapters of Genesis, and so if he was wrong on that, then how can you trust anything else he said? They don't see, they don't see the ramifications of where they're going with their syncretism, with their combining of secular and sacred. And what it ultimately does is dilutes the sacred. There are ideas that evangelicals are embracing in this world. The idea of that sexuality is on a spectrum and that gender is a construct. 
I was at the doctor the other day. I've been having some, a few health kind of issues, and part of it, um, I've been reluctant. I don't like to take medications. I don't like to take medicine. And in part is if there's an alternative to taking medications, I'm going to go for the alternative because I don't like the, the side effects, which aren't really side effects, they're effects. But if there's a side effect to be had, typically I'll have it. So I've been, I've been, I have been pushing away the whole idea of taking some medicines. And one of them was blood pressure. And so he, he brought it up last year. And so I said, well, I, you know, okay, lower the salt. I'll go, I'll start exercising, which I have done. But it's, it's not stopping it, right? So he's talking to me about blood pressure medication and cholesterol medication and, and one or two other problems that I've had. And he said, Mr. Snyder, there are things that are just true and unalterable about, that are just true of people your age and your race and your gender. He said, those are things that are not going to be changed. They're unalterable. We can't change those things. And so I'm listening to this. And he wasn't that as, as intense as I just made it, but he was, he was pretty blunt. He was saying I was an old white guy, is what he was saying. <laughs> and um, so I said to him, but what if I identify as something other than I am? And he said, he kind of smiled. I could tell he was smiling under his mask because I saw his, you know, saw his eyes kind of squint. And what if I identify as something other than I am? He goes, no. Not even then. I said, well, what if I identify as a seven-foot-tall Asian woman? And I saw his eyes crying. His PA was in there in training, and she, I could tell she was smiling as well. And he said, no, not even then. So my doctor, who I thought was an intelligent and knowledgeable and a man of science, was really a transphobe. And, you know, he, he was a fear monger, for one thing, because he said that reality and perception was, was different. You know what the world is saying now? Perception is reality. And so if I perceive something to be a certain way or, per, or perceive or interpret feelings that I may be having as being indicative that I'm something other than what I am. So if I felt like a tree... You know, my perception, but why, why challenge that? How can you challenge my perception? I don't know how a tree feels. Sometimes I do feel like a tree. Sometimes I feel dumber than a stump. My point is, the world says perception is reality. That there can be and interpreted, my interpretation of reality is what's really true. It's absolute nonsense. This is the kind of empty delusion, vain deceit. That word, that word de deceit literally uh, in the original language is, is, is the word delusion. It's what I want to be so, to be so. He says, let no man beguile you with any of this. Anything that's outside of Christ. In Colossae, it was a number of things. Rule keeping and rituals and mystical experiences and self-denying religious practices and new revelation, new knowledge. And Paul says, don't let anybody, don't let anybody steer you away from Christ. We're to be united around Christ, settled upon Christ, exclusively to Christ or about Christ. And then verses 9 and 10, satisfied with Christ. After his warning, he says, be wary of any of these things that are not after Christ. Why? Because in him, in him dwelleth all the fullness of God bodily. Now don't miss that word bodily. We tend to, uh, we tend to 
neglect that one too. Then he says this, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He says, be convinced, be convinced that he is everything you need. All the fullness in one person, bodily, bodily. Jesus is not just one who has some of the truth about God. He, in his singular person, is the fullness of God. In him of whom all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. Not just some, all. And Paul is telling them, those false teachers, those philosophers, those advocates of vain deceit have nothing to add to him, no matter how persuasive they may be. Hence the word bodily means in his person he is everything about God that you need. So be convinced that in him is everything and be content with everything. Someone wrote, in later Gnostic thought, Christ was seen as the last in the line of mediators. But Paul states, that all the fullness of the divine being or Godhead dwells directly in Christ, and this indwelling is permanent. He is everything that you need. Someone else wrote, the readers have already been filled in him. In their union with Christ, they have received fullness of salvation, so they do not need to stoop down before the spiritual powers of the universe or to observe their, the rules their rules to attain this fullness as the false teaching demanded. So what do you want to add to that which is complete? How do you improve that? You can't. There's no improving it. He is the fullness of God bodily. He is in his person is everything. There was in a gallery some years ago that... Um, I guess they wanted to make it a little interactive among the visitors to the art gallery. And so there was a painting that was there, and they had paints, and they had palettes. And there was a little sign that told the onlooker that they had permission to add anything to the canvas that they thought would improve that, improve that painting. So not everybody did it, of course, but there were some people that fancied themselves to be artistic, and so they looked at this painting that was there, and then they took the palette, and they dabbed a little bit, and they, they would add certain things there until they were satisfied, and they put it back down. And then someone else would come, and they would look at it, and, and they'd pick up the palette, and they would dab a little bit here and there. And so over time, this painting that had been finished and had been attractive began to look grotesque with all of the people's additions to make it more perfect. <laughs> adding to it was unnecessary, and adding to it made it a horrible, horrible mess. Listen, this is what the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, is telling you and I. We are to be united, but that, un that being united, that being unified, is around a person, Christ. We are to be settled upon Christ, rooted, built up in him. We are to be exclusively about Christ, not syncretistic. And we are to be satisfied with Christ. We truly are complete in him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word this evening. Now, help the impact of it to settle in. Help the truth of this to settle into our hearts and minds. And I pray that it would be lived out, that in our daily thoughts, as we dwell upon the person of, the, of your Son, may that May that meditation erupt in thanksgiving. May that, that focus and the centering of our thoughts upon him cause us to rejoice that we had everything, everything needed.
to life and godliness within him. And in him certainly dwells all, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that that is your design, and that is the way you would have us to be satisfied in your person, is in the, in the exaltation and the, the comprehension and the, the estimation of your Son and all that he's accomplished for us and all that you have that you have imbued him with and that he expresses of you. We thank you for him. With heads bowed and eyes closed, in this time of quietness between you and the Lord right now, would you thank him? Would you take a moment and give, express your gratitude for the Savior? Sing with me, if you would. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Just the chorus there. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We are dismissed. God bless you.